Absolute power corrupts absolutely. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. These were the words of John Dahlberg Acton. Uh, you might know him as Lord Acton, who was a 19th century English Catholic. He was known as a liberal historian, politician, and writer. And if you haven't heard this proverb or this saying, absolute power corrupts absolutely, uh, you may have heard its more positive counterpart popularized by Spider-Man. With great power comes great responsibility. And um, it's a pretty good saying. But Lord Acton was not a fictional character. He said these words in a letter to a bishop as he contemplated the moral problem, because he was a Catholic liberal historian, he was contemplating the moral problem of writing history about his own tradition, his own religious background. He was starting to become uneasy with their history. In particular, he was writing about the Inquisition and all of the atrocities that were committed in the name of the Roman Catholic religion, <clears throat> in the name of Christianity, really. And so he had to write about many of the shortfalls of men who were supposed to be good and godly leaders. He had to write about lots of bad popes. And I've <clears throat> told you a little bit about some bad popes. But Lord Acton, writing to um, Bishop, what was his name? Um, a bishop, I forget his name. These, this is the context of the words when he says absolute power corrupts absolutely. So he's writing to this bishop, and this is what he says in one of his many letters. I cannot accept your canon that we are to judge pope and king unlike other men with a favorable presumption that they did no wrong. If there is any presumption, it is the other way against holders of power, increasing as the power increases. Historic responsibility has to make up for the want or the lack of legal responsibility. Power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Now, now there is the essence of what he's saying there, which most of us would probably agree with. There's got to be higher accountability for those that are given much power and authority and responsibility. Now, I've read some of his other letters. I don't agree with... Uh, all of what he says in his letters, but we can all agree that we have observed what he's talking about throughout all human history. When you elevate a sinner to an unchecked level of power and authority, what do we often see? Corruption. Uh, a tyrant wants no one in his way. He is above the law. He is the law. So that's why we in society don't want anyone in the world to have any absolute power. We don't want that. But there is one who has absolute power and he is not corrupt. Neither is he infiltrated or infected by any corruption even outside of himself. One who uses his sovereign power only ever for good. Our sovereign God. And for many who don't know personally this good God, the idea of his absolute power makes him sound like one of the tyrants. I uh, was watching one of these videos. You know those videos where they take people from different backgrounds, they put them in a room, and then there's chairs on the right, there's chairs on the left, and then they say, agree or disagree? And they ask some controversial question, and then you choose where you sit. The question given was, agree or disagree, Satan is evil. And there was only one guy, and I believe he was a Roman Catholic, that sat on the agree, Satan is evil, while everyone else sat on the disagree side and said, no, Satan isn't evil. And the Roman Catholic explained a little bit, it's an important part of our Catholic faith, that there is a real God and there is a real Satan, and he is sinful, he is evil, he's the one that influenced mankind. It was a brief explanation. 
And then the other side came along, and what did they say? They said, go, let's go back to the book. Let's go back to the story of Genesis. There's God, and he is giving all of these restrictions and limitations and saying, oh, that tree? You can't eat from that tree. And what did Satan do? Let's really think about it. What did Satan do? He opened up their minds, and he <laughs> let them see the truth about good and evil, while the God that you worship was withholding that. So really, Satan did not do an evil thing. He did a good thing. That was the conclusion that the majority of the people there made, and they really believed it. They, they frown upon, and many frown upon, this idea of ultimate authority, of the one who lays down the rules, of the one who is, yes, very much, able to restrict and limit us. A sovereign God who has a will that he reveals, the commandments that he gives to us. But if you are a Christian, and this is what I bring forward to you tonight, the Christian is daily in the presence of a God who exercises his sovereignty to graciously care for his people. That's the God that we have. That's the God whom we believe in. So if you look at your liturgy, the outline is simple. Three things I want to highlight. First of all, his sovereign care for his people. Of course, this is a specific kind of care that is granted to his covenant people. Secondly, we will look at his sovereign control over his enemies. Just because they are not under his loving and sovereign care doesn't mean that they get away from the realities of his sovereign rule. And then lastly, we will briefly conclude by thinking about just the concept of God's sovereignty as something that comforts the afflicted and afflicts the comfortable. Thinking about what that really means. So in Proverbs verse, uh, chapters 14 and 15, we have um, talked about living before the wise king. You know that word, uh, phrase, Koram Deo, in the presence of God, living before the wise king, living before our wise father, and now living before our sovereign God. So firstly, let's look at his sovereign care over his people, or for his people. Here's where we left off last week in verse 24. The path of life leads upward for the prudent, that he may turn away from Sheol beneath. This is what God wants for people. God is good. He wants his sinners to turn away from death, to turn away from evil, because he wants them to live, to have life. But because he is good, he hates evil. He hates death. He hates sin, and he must deal with it justly. So we begin with a reminder of how the Lord views sin versus righteousness. The wicked versus his righteous ones. And, and how... He deals with the two quite differently. Look at verse 26. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, but gracious words are pure. Remember all the way back in verse 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. God's eyes are are everywhere. And now we learn here in verse 26, he doesn't just see what you do, he even always knows what's happening in your mind. He sees what you do, he even knows what you think. That's a sovereign God. He sees everything, he knows everything, he has power over everything. And we see in verse 27, whoever is greedy for unjust gain troubles his own household, but he who hates bribes will live. This sovereign God orders the world in such a way that temporal judgments are already falling upon those who reject the wisdom of God. There are already earthly consequences for those that go against His wisdom. But those who have the fear of the Lord, most importantly, are spared from His eternal judgment. Verse 28, The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours out evil Things. The proverb is telling us the life that one currently lives gives evidence. Remember this morning, the importance of evidence gives evidence of whether they are under the loving care of the good and sovereign God or are under their wrath. You can see it. We've been seeing this all throughout Proverbs. The way they walk, the way they talk, the way they act 
the way they behave. You can tell if a person is living in the presence of a good God whom they love or if they are rebels against the holy God. In verse 29, the Lord is far from the wicked, you see, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. Here we are introduced <clears throat> to his sovereign, loving care. He is the only one who is able to do this. Mary can't do this, even though we believe she's in heaven. And that is that he would be seated, seated in heaven, enthroned in heaven, and have millions and millions of his saints on earth, sometimes at the same time, praying to him, and because he is an infinite being, and he is omniscient, and all-powerful, all, all of those things, he is able to hear every single one of the prayers, personally, in a real way. You ever watch um, Bruce Almighty? You know, when all the prayers started coming in? <laughs> just, just start freaking out, right, with all of that. No, we can't do that. We are finite beings. Even Mary is a finite being. She can't hear all of the prayers of these people claiming to call upon her name. Only God is the one who always hears the prayers of the righteous. James 5.16, The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Who are the righteous? They are those who have had the righteousness of God's wise and perfect Son imputed to them. Those are His righteous ones. And it is their prayers which He is glad to hear. God is far from the wicked, but He is near those whom He counts as righteous. God is near to those who draw near to Him, pleading nothing but the merits of His obedient Son. Look at verse 30. The light of the eyes rejoices the heart. And good news, the gospel is literally good news, right? Refreshes the soul. Refreshes the bones, I should say. This is reminiscent of Psalm 32. Remember what David prayed? But when I kept silent about his sin, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Have you ever been so deeply convicted by your sin but you are still not confessing it to the Lord, not bringing it to the Lord repentantly, but you're starting to feel the weight of it. You ever experience that thing when there's such a strong spiritual, spiritual weight that you, all, you start to feel a physical burden? Almost like the, the Christian from Pilgrim's Progress. It's almost like the heavy hand of God is upon you and it's weighing you down. I, I remember times where I sinned and I kept it to myself and I left it unconfessed to God and my chest actually started hurting. You maybe have felt the overwhelming sense, even to a physical level, of your sin. But then what does he say? I acknowledge my sin to you, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. And right then and there, his bones, which felt like they were wasting away, were restored, were refreshed. In the Hebrew, that word refresh, you can translate it as makes fat. Makes fat and supple, complete and whole. It is only those who have been forgiven of their sins who are covered by this sovereign care of God that has this experience of having prayers heard and having their bones refreshed or made fat. And if you are not covered by this, then it's simple. You need to be righteous. God only hears the prayers of the righteous. God only answers the prayers of His righteous ones. And if you do not have this experience, what you need is righteousness. But just remember that it's a righteousness that you can't create on your own, that you cannot have on your own, that cannot be found in your own self. It is an alien righteousness. You have to look not in your own little sinful heart, but you have to look to one outside of yourself, Jesus Christ whose righteousness is available to any, anyone at all who turns to him by faith. That's where your righteousness will be found. To them, those who God counts as righteous, he exercises his sovereignty for their good, for their spiritual strength. It's as if he reaches out from heaven and even disciplines them so that they would grow. 
so that they would be made fat spiritually in a good way. Verse 31, the ear that listens to life-giving reproof will dwell among the wise. Whoever ignores instruction despises himself, but he who listens to reproof gains intelligence. This is the way that God has ordered the universe where even in the created order, God is supernaturally at work in the lives of his people so that you would be disciplined, you would be instructed, you would be reproved so that you might gain true intelligence, that you might be filled with the fear of the Lord. This is one of the ways that God exercises his sovereignty. Now, the word sovereignty, we keep using it. What does it mean? Well, it can simply mean supreme power. Or authority. We often use it to describe <clears throat> God's meticulous control over all things, and oftentimes that's actually God's providence. It's related, but that's God controlling all things. He has oversight over all, and he's, He exercises that oversight in a special way for His chosen ones. As we get to chapter 16, the plans of the heart belong to man. But the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes. But here's what matters. The Lord weighs the spirit. Commit your work to the Lord. And your plans will be established. To commit your plans to the Lord here is is to roll upon the Lord, quite literally. To surrender our plans to God, knowing that at the end of the day, it's God's plan that will prevail. So it is to submit ourselves to His will. It is when we say, your will, not mine, that truly our plans will be established. Don't get this verse wrong. This is not saying, here you are, you've got your own preconceived notion about how your plans will go, all right? You wrote it down, this is how my future is going to be. This is who I'm going to marry. This is where I'm going to live. This is the kind of job that I'm going to have. You write it all down. Here's your plans. And then you submit it to God like a piece of, like like an assessment. Here you go, Lord. I've written it down. I'm sure you're going to give me a good mark. HD for me. I planned it quite well. Now give your stamp of approval. Establish my plans. No. It is when we roll upon the Lord. When we surrender to God, your will, not mine, then our plans will be established, for now his plans become ours. Christians, the almighty God of the universe has seen fit to exercise his absolute power to care for you. He's got plans for you. Now, coming from a loosey-goosey background, you might be afraid of using passages like Jeremiah, for I know the plans I have for you. And, you know, you're quick to go, that doesn't apply to us, that's the Old Testament, that's for Israel, he had a specific plan for them. Well, can I tell you that that does spiritually apply to us? For we are the fulfillment, we are the spiritual Israel of God, we are the church of the living God, we are the one and only bride of Christ, and you as a Christian can know truly that God says, for I know the plans I have for you. Now, following the trajectory of old to new, from types and shadows to substance, when God goes on to say, plans not to harm you, but to prosper you. Even reading in the light of the book of Proverbs, what are we really speaking about? We're talking about the most important thing, which is spiritual prosperity. Becoming rich in the things of God, being able to heap up heavenly treasures, not earthly treasures, which which moth will eat and which will rust and decay, but becoming heavenly in our riches. God exercises His absolute power to care for you in this way. You, whom He has set His love upon from eternity. Ephesians 1 Five, in love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. So his way of exercising his day-to-day power to order all of your steps in everything that happens in our life, that's this sweet and wonderful thing we call providence. And do you know how he is using his providence in your life? God can do so many things with his power. God can do so many things in the world 
with his meticulous providence. And of all things, the people of God are told in Romans 8, 28, and we know, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Of the many good things that God can do in the world with his absolute sovereign power, he has chosen out of his eternal love for you that he would meticulously, by his providence, order everything, every leaf that falls, every time the rain pours, the changing of the seasons, your, your aging and your growth and this happening in the world, everything, he is ordering everything for your good. That's God's sovereign care for his people. And you tell me it doesn't apply to you, for I know the plans I have for you. In a proper context, it absolutely does. He's ordering everything in your life right now for your ultimate good. And of course, one of the hardest times to really like that verse and to really embrace that reality of God's sovereign care is when the plans that God has for us seems to be horrible. They're painful. They're against everything that we by our own selves desire and want. And in those times, often what we want in the moment is to just set free, to be set free from the painful discipline and from the hurtful affliction. But remember the way that God uses his sovereign care. He's not here to baby you so that you would remain weak and immature. He is here to grow you and to strengthen you. That's why as we read, he reproves us. And when we receive reproof, we grow, we gain knowledge. He is, in, in essence, spiritually, divinely spanking you like his little child so that you could be whipped up into shape because in his divine genius, he knows you, oh stubborn you, sometimes need to get smacked. And so much good comes out of it. For there are times where it's the only way he can get your attention. Oh, ye of little faith. That's how much he lovingly cares for you. He's willing to go all the way to that point. Got into a car accident recently. You hate all of it. Yep, plan for your ultimate good. You're broke now. Yep, that's planned for your ultimate good. You're sick now. You're dying. Oh, definitely plan for your ultimate good. You didn't win the powerlifting competition, I can tell you. Definitely plan for your ultimate good. He's planned it all. Even our afflictions, they may be used for our sanctification. That's why. And all of them are actually, in terms of the way that God has set things in stone, they're all necessary steps for you to go towards eternal glory. Amen. Through many trials and tribulations, we shall enter the kingdom of heaven. They are necessary steps in God's sovereign plan. But for those who do not belong to him, here's our second point. You need to consider his sovereign control over his enemies. Verse 4, the Lord has made everything for its purpose. Everything, guys, even the wicked for the day of trouble. That's a hard pill to swallow. That's hard to stomach. Can we say to those who die in their sins, those who have not Christ, for I know the plans I have for you. Well, God does know the plans he has for the wicked. He has a purpose for the wicked, even the wicked for the day of trouble. God has plans for those outside of Christ as well. The wicked for the day of trouble. I, I want to ask, what is the day of trouble? Job 21.30 calls this the day of calamity. That day of wrath. So ultimately this is, make no mistake, this is talking about judgment day. That is the day of trouble. Those who do not belong to Christ, who stand on their own unrighteousness instead of the righteousness of the Savior, are being prepared for judgment. Yeah, God is in control, both of the righteous and the unrighteous, but His sovereignty is used differently in their lives. It's kind of like the preaching of the gospel. 
For God's elect people, that very good gospel that is proclaimed to them is a means which the Spirit uses to bring them to faith and repentance and a life of sanctification and so on. You know, we, don't, we don't know who the elect and non-elect are, but that same gospel preached, when preached to the heathen who are reprobate and who hate the Lord, the very same gospel preached to them becomes, in their experience, a means to hate God even more. For they receive light, and often they will scoff at it. And those who have received light and have scoffed at it, a greater judgment awaits them. It is a very serious thing. It is a frightening thing to be a preacher of the gospel. For you will encounter people who will gladly receive it. All glory to God. But you will time and time again encounter people who will use the preaching of the gospel as an occasion to fan aflame their hatred for this horrible deity. In the same way, the message of God's sovereignty affects people differently and is used, the sovereignty itself, differently. His sovereignty for the believer is exercised for their eternal welfare, for their good, and that they might live life to the fullest. For the unbeliever, his sovereignty is exercised for their ultimate judgment. And this is not cruel. This is just. This is the sovereign God glorifying himself by achieving justice against sinners. Now some may say, well, he be sovereign if he has all the power, if he is the one that is able to change hearts, why would he find fault against the hard-hearted sinner? And that brings us to our scripture reading, Romans chapter 9. And before we get to that slam dunk part that everybody loves, let's just sense the tone in which the Apostle Paul speaks of these things. Look at chapter 9, verse 1. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. This is not a theological slam dunk moment for him. He is in anguish. What he's about to say, he says with heartbreak. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ, for the sake of my brothers, my, my kinsmen according to the flesh, they are Israelites. And to them belong the adoption, the glory, the confidence, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promise. To them belong all of these things. Yet this is what happened. So speaking of God's sovereign choice of Jacob over Esau, he talks about how while they were still in the womb, again he says this with anguish, with tears, with a broken heart. He says in verse 11, Though they were not yet born and had no, done nothing either good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. And then speaking of how God hardened Pharaoh's heart, we read in verse 17, for the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I have raised you up. Does that sound similar to the proverb? He has a purpose for all, even the wicked, for the day of trouble. For this very purpose, I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. Let's remember the, co the context of that hardening. It's not as if Pharaoh was a righteous saint. And then God's like, oh, you're trying to do good? No, I'm going to make you bad. No. God hardened his heart as a judicial judgment against his already hardened rebelliousness. It's not injustice, it's justice. And then finally, God addresses our question. The question that we just asked. Why is there still fault? Verse 19. Why does he still find fault? You say, for who can resist his will? But who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? 
has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump, listen to this, one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? in order to make known the riches of His glory for vessels of mercy, which He has prepared beforehand for glory. Even us whom He has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. Again, these are some punches to the gut. These are hard pills to swallow. And one who doesn't know the goodness of God reads these verses this way. There it is. I told you guys, like Lord Acton said, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. But we who have come to know the Lord and fear Him, we say, no, absolute power exercised both lovingly and justly. That's what we see here. We're seeing absolute power Exercise righteously and mercifully. We're seeing both love and wrath. We're seeing both justice and grace. That's why if we go back to Proverbs 16, we read in verse 5, everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. You know, it's almost like, it's almost like the Holy Spirit just inspired all of this stuff in such an in interconnected, intertextual way that after saying, even the wicked for the day of trouble, verse 5 comes along and it immediately confronts those who would question this and says, everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. It's like, were we supposed to be reading this with Romans 9? Well, I think so. Be assured, he will not go unpunished. Those who are currently warring against God they will not go unpunished. But if that is you, you do need to know something. Look at verse 6. By steadfast love and faithfulness, iniquity is atoned for. And by the fear of the Lord, one turns away from evil. You need to know this. The Christian was once an enemy of God, but was reconciled to God by the death of his son. Romans 5.10 so if you are an enemy of God right now, look at verse 6. By steadfast love and faithfulness, iniquity is atoned for. There is an atonement. There is only one that is available to you, which has come into this world because of his steadfast love and faithfulness. Love manifests. His name is Jesus Christ. His faithfulness all his days in perfect obedience to his Father. He is the atonement that is able to take away our iniquities. And here then is a message of hope. Verse 7. When a man's ways, I want you to catch this. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. When, the man, when a man's ways please the Lord, Christ is that man. Christ is that one and only man whose ways please the Lord. And because his ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with God. So enemy of God, escape his wrath now and turn to the one whose ways please the Lord that he might bring you into peace with God. Now lastly, thinking about the sovereignty of God, uh, I believe this is a concept which every time we think about it, something happens. It can be used to comfort the afflicted, but it can also be used to afflict the comfortable. Recently at some camp, Mitch was there, and I prayed it a few times in a prayer. I, I sometimes pray that, right? Lord, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Uh, it's not original to me. Nothing is original to me. Many people have said that before. Mitch asked me afterwards, like, yeah, you know, it was uh, that, that prayer, right? It's so interesting. And I was like, yeah, yeah. And he goes, so what does it mean? <laughs> so what, is, what does that prayer mean? Yeah, what, what does that mean? I should ask. Well, in this context, the comfortable are those who love their sin. 
The comfortable are those who are happy and comfortable in this world. Those who are happy with no need for Christ. The afflicted are those who are crushed by the weight of their sin. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. What? For they shall be comforted. The truth of God's sovereignty has a similar effect. You know, we, we see in verse 9, the heart, of a man, the heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. The comfortable one goes, the heart of man plans his way. God, stop trying to establish my steps. My steps are just fine. Thank you very much. Yet the one who is afflicted by the weight of their own foolishness and lack of wisdom. Yes, he plans his way, but then he comes to the Lord saying, Lord, if you will not establish my steps, I will only go the way of destruction. So if you are afflicted, rest in this truth that God is a good and sovereign Lord who is ordering every step of your life and who is your loving Father in the Lord Jesus Christ comfortable with your life? Just happy? Happy without Christ? Happy going to church but not actually truly relating with the triune God? Be afraid of this truth. Reckoning with this truth, wrestling with this truth ought to afflict your conscience. Am I really okay? Because those comfortable, happy in their sins need the afflicting power of the law which condemns them. But those who have been stung by the law and are convicted of their sins need the comfort of Christ, the sweet balm of the gospel of grace, and the sweet knowledge of knowing that the God who saved me is also a God who knows the plans He has for me, and who orders my steps, and whose plans shall prevail. And why does that sound good to me? Because when it comes to his plans, he is working all things for my good. So may our meditation upon the sovereignty of God lead us not into the temptation of fatalism. We're going to sit back and not care about anything. Nor into obsession over theological controversy. For the sovereignty of God should not be a matter of controversy. It ought to be for us a matter of worship. When the sovereignty of God is preached, it's not, supposed to me, it's not supposed to cause us to get into just obsession over controversial matters. It's really meant to put us at rest and to bring us to a deeper worship of this sovereign God. Oh, oh Lord, we should ask, do, lead us not into fatalism and needless controversy. Lead us instead to spiritual comfort and rest. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we thank you for as Jesus prays in Matthew 11, you have chosen to reveal these things to babes and to hide them from the wise. Yes, those wise in their own eyes. It is you, O oh God, that has opened our eyes to this wisdom. You've done it sovereignly. And you continue to order all things that we might grow in wisdom as your people. Furnish us with this teaching from the Proverbs to have a more God-centered, heaven-bound view of life and of every event that happens in our own lives. Lord, again, for those of us going through many pains and many afflictions, May their prayer not just be relief from the pain, but may it be a deeper sense of how you are using the pain for their good, how you are using their affliction for their sanctification, and that they might become steps towards inevitable glory. When we think of your sovereignty of God, after hearing what we heard today, May we be quick to remember the word care, loving care. Whenever we think of your sovereignty of God, bring to our memory the fact that you exercise it in such a loving way towards us. 
that you are so self-giving and you are always willing our good. May we never think any less of you, our great and sovereign God, in whose presence we are living every moment, every day. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.